Coming up on this episode of The Social Hour, Seth Godin is joining Amber and me. He's an author, he's a motivator, he's a blogger, he's a lot of things. He's pretty awesome. He's going to talk to us about some of his latest projects. Plus, Twitter's new app, Vine, and blogging on Quora. Do you want to do that? Should you do that? All that and more next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash android. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is the Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur, episode 95, recorded Friday, January 25th, 2013. This episode of the Social Hour is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Social Hour. It's episode 95. From Petaluma, California, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur from a very snowy Toronto. Sarah, I have to say, we're getting quite a bit of snow, and it does look quite pretty. Well, you know, there are there have been a lot of conferences around the world I mean, that people I know have, have been at, and it seems like it's dumping snow all over the place. Mm-hmm. San Francisco has been a little bit dreary. Um, the San Francisco area, but certainly not snowy. So I don't know if that's good or bad or you're keeping warm, obviously. Yeah, yeah. We had a a pretty bad cold spell this uh, past week. So it was uh, dipping down into frigid temperatures. And uh, when the snow comes, at least we're hovering back again around zero degrees Celsius. So uh, that is considered nice at this time of year in uh, Toronto for January. So I can't complain too much. Uh, But nonetheless, having been in Florida for four weeks, uh, it's a bit of a, a shock to the system. Well, without further ado, we should uh, bring in our very excited about this guest. And this is actually somebody, Amber, that you've met a few years ago. Is that right? Yeah. So I had a chance to meet uh, Seth Godin a few years ago. It was very short and memorable for me, but uh, uh, I've been following his work like many other people in uh, the social media space and internet space and people running their own businesses. So we are so excited to have you on, Seth. Thanks for coming on the social hour. Oh, it's a pleasure, guys. Thank you for having me. So Seth, um, I actually, it's funny, I have not met you in person, (laughs) but I'm very familiar with your work. Um, You are part of my blog role. And, uh, you know, to to, to use a bit of an antiquated term. Um, But I'm actually, and we can talk about all of your your, your many projects online, but certainly I think the most recent is your latest book, which you published in a, I guess, rather unconventional way. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, well, unconventional always keeps me on my toes. The idea was, (laughs) could I set a standard and establish a a method where authors could use Kickstarter to organize their fans because the first 10,000 copies of a book are really hard to sell. And if I could pre-sell them to an organized group of people, I thought I could then take that news to the booksellers and to the publishers and supercharge the way a book would work. And I figured if I did it out loud and in public, other authors could follow in my footsteps. So in June, uh, I launched it. We hit our goal in three hours, and in about six days, I sold off all the prizes we had. Everything was limited, and um, I spent every penny and a little bit more building four books, one of which weighed 17 pounds, and uh, they all came out about four weeks ago. Amazing. Congratulations. Uh, definitely uh, not not so much a traditional way to uh, publish. However, we're seeing more and more people doing this. We've had Guy Kawasaki on the show in the past talking about uh, how he's gone to digital publishing, for example. You've had a ton of success with uh, more traditional publishing. So what was it about this experience that you liked better? What other opportunities did it give you? Well, I love books. The, 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 just the touching. I mean, I, I, want, I want to show you. Uh, I happen to have it here. It, it literally is bigger <laughs> to small children. Wow. Um, and you could never make a book like that. The bookstore wouldn't take it. And I didn't sell it. It's just for my backers. And what it changes if you're a writer is the mindset of instead of finding readers for your writing, you're doing writing for your readers. And I think that's similar to the way the two of you guys get to do your program. You know there's a loyal group of people who are going to watch. So you get to make something for them 
instead of every time just yelling into the wilderness. And one of the things that's lonely about an author is you don't know if that next book has an audience. And what was scary for me about this Kickstarter is I didn't start writing it until everyone had signed up. And so I was under the gun. I had made big, big, big promises. And I was on the hook to spend 300K in printing and creation and everything else. Now I had to go do it in 100 days. And I loved that sprint and I loved the challenge. I'm not sure I'm up for it ever again. Certainly not in <laughs> six weeks until I take a nap. But it was a thrilling thing to do. I mean, you, 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 you say that it was more about can this concept work before can I write this book actually happened. Did you not have an idea? I mean, how much of it was a, holy crap, I actually have to write this book? Was it really from scratch? Or did, did you just have a, a vague notion of what you wanted to write about? Well, I, um, I obviously told people what the book was about in the Kickstarter. And I had probably written 10 pages of a table of contents. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was it. Uh, the thing is, some people get writer's block. I don't because I write like I talk and no one gets talker's block. So I knew I could talk something and have it end up on paper. The challenge was if I didn't have to please any middlemen, if I didn't have to please an editor and a publisher and a bookstore buyer, could I write something better? And what I like to think about when I look at the Icarus Deception is it's a book with no compromises. I didn't write it hoping to trick strangers into buying this new book of mine. I didn't call it the foolproof, easy, seven-point plan for building your social media network, because that's not what it is. It is a very personal meditation by me about the end of the industrial age. And I had the privilege of doing it because my fans said, go ahead, write what you want. Well, you know, you, you, yeah. oh, go ahead, Amber. Oh, I was just going to say, I had a chance to uh, read the book over the holidays and, uh, you know, it's bang on with what you just said. I mean, this seems like a very different book than what you've put out in the past. And uh, I was just hoping you could talk a little bit about that before Sarah has our next question in terms of the content of the book, because I think it really applies to our audience. We have a lot of people out there who are kind of, you know, making it online, who are, are, are paving their own way and really are artists. Yeah, so the, the core idea of the book, Amber, is art, not art like painting or even the stuff you McLeod does, but art in the sense of a human being doing personal work that might not work, that connects to another human being. That if the future of our economy is about connection, not who owns a machine, because machines are worth less than they ever were, not who is doing a job that's written down in a manual, because if you're doing something that's written down, someone cheaper than you is going to be able to do it, but connection, people who trust you, people who want to hear from you, people who will follow you. If connection is at the heart of the economy, the only people we want to connect with are people who are making human scale art. And I see artists all around, the kind of people who are on your show are artists. They are blazing a new path. And what I wanted to say to those people is, you are on the right track. Now you have to be even more bold, even more personal, and risk even more. Seth, I, uh, I, I mentioned that I've been following your blog for years, and you're extremely pr prolific. I don't know if you have a rule that you write something every single day, uh, but that's pretty much what you do. <laughs> and I, I know that, I, you know, for many bloggers, if, you know, if that's your full-time job, that that's what you do, but you're obviously an extremely busy person. Have you seen the audience, the way that you write, the way that you connect with people change in a blogging format over the years since we have so many more tools than when you set up your TypePad account however many years ago? Yeah, no, my TypePad account is a little like, you know, driving around town in a Model A or something, but I don't see any reason to switch because it's not broken. Uh, yes, the world has changed dramatically. I started writing every day, I think seven years ago, as a discipline. Because if you know that there's going to be a post tomorrow, you're going to do everything you can to make it better than it would be if you just wrote a lousy one. So it makes my writing better to know I'm on this schedule. It's actually not that difficult to write every day, just like it's not that difficult to talk every day. That if you know you're going to write, you'll come up with something useful. And I'm not great all the time but I'm doing it often enough that being great once in a while is sufficient. But what I've noticed in, among the audience is this, a, you know, a 20 or 30 or 40 paragraph blog post used to be normal, used to be common, and people would take time to read it. 
But now a lot of people look at that as if you're publishing war and peace. That if it's more than three sentences, there better be something juicy in sentence number three or they're just going to leave. Because in this 140 character universe we're moving into, it's getting ever more superficial and ever more jump, 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 jump. And I understand why, because people have too many people to follow. But I'm hoping that every once in a while I seduce people into slowing down enough into thinking a little bit more deeply than the three seconds they've allocated. <laughs> I think uh, one thing that's really interesting about what you're doing right now is in some ways you are taking a lot of risks. And I know that that's something that you talk about in the book. I was reading an article from CNBC and they mentioned that uh, Seth Godin's key to success is to do something ridiculous. And I was just hoping that you could expand a little bit on that for our viewers and listeners, because I know we have so many entrepreneurs who are listening and just scared to take that risk and that, that leap of faith. Here's the, the important thing. Yes, ridiculous is the new remarkable. That if you want an idea to spread, if you want to do something interesting, it's got to be ridiculous. And after it works, everyone says, well, of course. But before it works, everyone says, that's ridiculous, especially like your mother-in-law and other skeptics. The good news is that the cost of being wrong is tiny. That in 1957, when Ford Motor Company discovered they were wrong about the Edsel, they lost a billion dollars. Today, if you're wrong about a blog post, tomorrow comes, it's over, right? Today, if you're wrong about you know, building a web app, it didn't take that long to build a mobile app and get it into the world compared to the cost of when I was in the software business in 1985 of building a, a floppy disk thing that played on four floppy disks and took 11 months for 20 people to build. So all the failures are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And the only thing that's holding us back is not the cost of failing, it's thinking about failing. Seth, we've got uh, squidoo.com slash Seth in your, in your little, uh, right under your name. So anybody who's watching the show is probably like, well, what is that if they haven't gone there already? Do you want to tell us a little bit about, um, about this company? Seven years ago, Sarah, we started, a couple of friends and I started a company called Squidoo. It's the 50th biggest website in the United States, believe it or not. Um, and just before Christmas, it hit 38. And the idea is anyone can build a page about anything they're passionate about. So we have 3 million people who have built more than 4 million pages on topics that they care about, travel or crafts or vegetarian cooking. And we pay royalties to all of our users. Uh, tens of millions of dollars we've given to them and to their charities. And I'm pleased that last year we gave hundreds of thousands, almost a million dollars to charity alone, because everybody who builds a page can allocate the, the, the little bit of royalty they get from that page to the charity of their choice. That's why I started it, because I wanted to give people both a platform to speak up and a way to give money to charity. What I've discovered is lots of people also like it as a tool to supplement their income and to share something they care about. So it's simpler than blogging. You build a page and that page lasts for a very long time and it's easy to use. It's not for everybody. It's not really particularly high tech, very simple. Um, but so far it's working, you know, drip by drip by drip, we're going to become a seven year overnight success. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, you have such a big following online and offline. And I know uh, probably a lot of people like myself are, are just curious about how you do what you do. I know you do a lot of speaking, you do a ton of writing, blogging, you know, there are people that we talk to have a hard time, you know, potentially blogging once a week, let alone every single day. So could you talk a little bit about your daily routine and how you manage to keep innovating? Well, you know, I think you in particular, Amber, will understand part of this. I don't go to any meetings. So that saves me five hours a day right there. <laughs> you know, be, being up in Toronto probably makes it easier than being in Petaluma to avoid that. Number two is uh, I don't watch television. So that saves me five more hours right there. So I'm already 40, 50, 60 hours ahead of most people before I even start the week. Uh, I've tried to, I've no employees here. You know, Squidoo has employees, but they're not in the same room as me. So the, the, the cool part of my life is I've stripped away all the distractions and all that's left is for me to do things that might not work. That's all I do for a living is things that might not work. And I think we can find the time to give a speech or to write a blog post or to do serious work if we're willing to stop hiding behind the stuff we have to do. Because you can just wipe a lot of that out if you decide to. Seth, you mentioned uh, our 140-character world and, and how uh, expanded, expanded blog posts and, and, and 
I don't know, being too wordy just doesn't really work for the public as a whole. Are there any social networks you think really have have tackled this well? That uh, you know, is is Twitter actually a great place to engage with other people, even if you have to be, uh, you know, use extreme brevity? Um, are there are there places that work better than others, in your opinion? You know, I was. Uh I, I'm going to sort of drop a name. I had lunch today with a famous rock star, which doesn't happen to me very often, so I'm <laughs> allowed to say it. And she was telling me why she loves Twitter so much. And I'm not on Twitter. I use it sometimes under another name just so I don't sound like a complete idiot when I talk about it. But I'm not an active Twitterer. Uh, and what she said about it that she likes is there's no expectation. If someone tweets something, they don't she's not obligated to tweet back, whereas if someone emails, it's sort of an obligation to do so. I feel like Twitter is a little bit like Grand Central Station, but filled with people you went to high school with. So you can see people over there and see people over there, notice that this person changed their haircut or that person has a doctor's appointment, but it's not a meeting. It's just sort of a, a jumble. So it's a critical uh, human function of sort of being aware of the people in our virtual neighborhood. But I don't think there are many people who will tell you that groundbreaking cultural ideas are being broken open on Twitter on a regular basis. It's, it, we need more nuance than that. So the very idea of a social network that takes ideas that we might not be ready for or things that we have to think deeply about, those are sort of at odds with each other. That mass marketing is about lots of people. You know, Facebook is really good at connecting almost a billion people. But cultural shift and ideas that might change everything, they don't really line up with mass and they never have. So the bookstore has never been a mass outlet that, you know, every once in a while a book sells 10 million copies, but that's how many people go to a bad movie. So <laughs> it's not a similar parallel here that what, as Chris Anderson has talked about with the long tail, is that the most interesting ideas live out in the long tail. That Fifty Shades of Grey is not an interesting idea, right? But Dan Pink's new book is an interesting idea. Dan Pink's new book is gonna sell as many copies over its whole lifetime as Fifty Shades sells in a week, but only one of them is gonna change the way we think about hard problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, last question from me, and uh, I want to just kind of look into the future a little bit and see what you see and, and what excites you about the future in terms of the information age that we're living in and the opportunities for so many people who are, in fact, artists. Well, here's the thing, Amber. You know, I've been doing this. Uh, I was online in 76, and I've been doing tech for a living since 85. Uh, I got on the Internet in 1990, seriously. Um, Everyone who's waiting for the next big technical thing before they take a leap uh, has already missed the last 20 opportunities. This is the future right this minute. The fact that I'm talking to people in two different countries, thousands of miles away, connecting over something cultural that we all agree with, that we're part of a tribe, that we're taking these ideas and spreading them to other people, some of whom are strangers, some of whom are connected, that today, a single individual gets to use the bounty of a technology that we didn't pay for, that was built by thousands and tens of thousands of people who never met each other, and that that idea can spread and reverberate and generously help other people make the next thing. Tell me again what people are waiting for. This is, <laughs> this is it right now. And if you're still waiting, it's because you're afraid. Okay, Seth, what is the next book going to be about? You said that uh, you, you might not uh, publish a book the way that you did, raising money on Kickstarter again because it was stressful, but I certainly can't believe that you're not working on something else. Okay, so here's rule number one. You're not allowed to ask an author who just published four books <laughs> their next book for at least six months. But rule number two is more than once I have said out loud, I am not publishing another book. And more than once I have been wrong. So please... Do not make me into a hypocrite. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Seth. And uh, it's just been a real treat to chat with you. And uh, good luck with everything. We'll make sure everybody can uh, get information about the book. And, and where can they find that information if they want to buy the book? Where's the best place to go? Um, the best place to go is your local bookstore. For the next few days, Barnes & Noble has big piles of them. And I would love to reward them for their confidence in me. But my, our friend, the Google, is always there. Type Seth if you want to find me. 
Type Icarus Deception if you want to find the new book. That's Icarus, I-C-A-R-U-S, Deception, if you're one of our audio listeners who is not familiar with that word. Seth Godin, thank you so much uh, for thank being with us on The Social Hour. Uh, awesome guest. Please come back anytime. I appreciate it. That was fun. See you. See you. Thank you so much. That is Seth Godin, the uh, extremely, I mean, I guess you call him, you know, he's, 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 he's famous. He said he was having lunch with a rock star the other day, but I think a lot of people <laughs> consider Seth a rock star. Amber, I, I, think you, I think you would agree. Yeah, I think he's definitely a rock star, especially in the world that we live in. So it was so nice to have him on. I just, I felt like we could have talked to him for the entire hour, but it's good to uh, leave our audience uh, waiting for him to come back with more. So it was nice to chat with him. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in more of what Seth does, more of a well-rounded uh, look into his life, SethGodin.com uh, is pretty much where all of all of his links originate. It's really cute. If you click on his head, then you get to his blog. It's just like, you know, it's just like he's thought of all of it. All right, a quick reminder that anybody who's not watching us live and would like to join us live next time, we record The Social Hour on Fridays at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Our website is twit.tv slash TSH. So if you miss us live, don't worry. All of our shows live in perpetuity uh, on this website. And in each episode, if you want some of the links that you know we may we may have mentioned or you know Seth's book you're not sure where to go we, we put all those links in our show notes on all of our episode pages and you can of course email us any comments or feedback or ideas or guest suggestions at the social hour at twit.tv all right let's take a moment to thank audible for sponsoring this episode of the social hour if you are the kind of person who wants to get through books on a regular basis I find no better way than to subscribe to audible.com because they have over 100,000 titles. Some of the stuff is, is, is nonfiction, Seth Godin type of stuff. Some of it <laughs> is fiction. They've got bestsellers, the, the books that you've heard of, The Fifty Shades of Greys and all, all that stuff. They've got new and notable sections. They have books that are read by their very own authors. Uh, some authors choose to have other people read their books. So you're always kind of rest assured that it's going to be a really neat voice um, reading back at you. I'm part of a monthly book club, and I have a really hard time reading uh, on a regular basis because, you know, Seth Godin is smart enough not to watch as much TV that I do. So that's pretty much where most of my reading <laughs> time goes. But I can get through a book on Audible during my commute, and Audible's got this kind of neat feature when, when you look at a book on, on the page, if you're deciding if you want to read it or not, um, it'll tell you how many listening hours it's going to be. Is it, you know, 10? Is it 17? Is it 24? So you can sort of be like, okay, I can get through this book in seven days or 13 days, or, you know, I could take a break over the weekend and that sort of thing. Audible's really, really great for that. So you should definitely peruse their titles. You will be, you will be floored at how many books are available on Audible. And, you know, books that you love, books, you know, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is one of my favorite books ever, ever, ever. Well, no one's ever read it to me. I've only just experienced it quietly on a page. So it's kind of a fun experience. It's really, it's, it's, a, it, it's a really neat thing. Here's what we would like you to do. If you go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. So again, audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. You can try Audible for free for 30 days. You have 30 days of going nuts. Read up a storm. You can also get a free audio book. So choose a book choose a book and when that free trial is up you keep that book that is your book for life and then of course you can uh, you can get a feel for how audible works and how you can incorporate it into your life all of your downloadable books are yours to keep you should see leo laporte's list he's got like 800 maybe more a lot of stuff he's insane yes <laughs> and he's just yeah he he has a lot of you know he does a lot of audio reading um and if you sign up for audible uh we really think you'll like it audiblepodcast.com slash social hour to get that free book and try out audible for 30 yeah you know days. what sarah a good free book to get i didn't realize that they do have uh seth's new book the icarus deception uh on audible right now and uh, he narrates it so that's kind of a perfect book for people to uh, download as their first free book absolutely and 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 he has a really good voice, you know? Yes. And by the way, for our audio listeners, he also has really cool glasses. I, I, I almost <laughs> must insist you at least watch the video version of the show just to I see, agree. you know, they're like these yellow rimmed. It's just very cool. I don't think I could pull that off, Amber, but Seth did, Seth did very he, well. He can pull a lot off, Sarah, yeah. I, I will say. <laughs> Pretty amazing. All right. Well, should we get into some of our news from the week? 
Yeah, let's do it. Uh, I know first up, uh, you had come across this article uh, from Quora that uh, Quora has just introduced blogs. And I can't wait to hear more about this because I'm trying to envision how they would be uh, useful and how they'd work. Yeah, so Quora is a little bit of that. Uh, we have we have mentioned Quora in the past on The Social Hour. It's a question and answer site. So you have an account, you may ask a question that a uh, somebody who is an expert at answering that or just you know has an answer for you um, can chime in, but it's not necessarily I ask a question and then Amber answers and that's the end of it. It sort of turns into an organic discussion in many ways from people who are saying, well, if there's a, you know, a, a right way to, you know, paint your house, then you, you all of a sudden have sort of this mass knowledge from people who are chiming in and it's very well done. Cora has announced uh, a blog feature um, and on, uh, on their own blog at blog.cora.com they sort of lay out what they, they think this is good for. They say, at Quora, we believe in great writers uh, and that they deserve readers. And they say, we're going to make this happen by identifying high quality writing and getting it in front of a large and relevant audience, of course, the Quora audience. They say, active writers on Quora average 30,000 monthly views and more, 350,000 estimated annual views. Our most active writers average 90,000 monthly views and 1 million estimated annual views. And many of the great answers on the site go viral that are read by tens of thousands of people. And that's true. I mean, there are, there are, very, there are some very popular Quora queries um, and, certain, and definitely a lot of popular people who uh, have a lot of knowledge to contribute. So they are uh, allowing me as a Quora, uh, uh, well, not a subscriber, a Quora user, the site is totally free, to now have the uh, functionality of blogging. And they say, this is for the person who is a great writer, has a lot of things to say, and doesn't have a big blog audience, or maybe doesn't even have a blog and doesn't really want to put in the effort of the marketing and, 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 and the sort of slowly building uh, up from scratch somewhere else. Why not do that within Quora? They say, if you're a good writer, but you don't have a lot of Twitter followers, you don't have a big audience on your blog, this is the place to be discovered quickly, because if you write one great post on Quora, it'll attract a big audience, no matter how many people know or follow you. So, and then they also say, listen, if you are a blogger with an established audience, if it's not so much about starting from scratch, then Quora is just an even better place to do that because you're gonna be pulling in more people that are already active on the service. Amber, I, I think this is a great idea. I love the mm. idea of, I mean, I, I like to think, you know, I mean, you and I are fairly well known in, in, in certain circles, but I'm not, I'm certainly not a, you know, a, a, a super popular blogger. In fact, I'm not much of a blogger these days at all. And if I were to start up again, you know, you sort of like that feedback of feeling like well, people reading this and that's what's going to keep me motivated. So I yeah. think figuring out where your motivation is, is where your efforts are, are best placed for that motivation is, is awesome. But I don't know that Core is the place that I would choose. I have a lot of options. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing. They have a ton of competition. I don't think people look and think of them exactly as a, a place where people go to write blog posts necessarily. It's more about getting information and sharing information. Although I will say when I've ever looked anything up on Quora, there are a lot of people who invest a ton of time and energy into creating a pretty thorough answer to people's questions. So in that case, I guess if you're part of the Quora community already and uh, you you submit a lot of content there, this could be really interesting. But yeah, I don't know if people think about the, the service as a place necessarily for bloggers right now. We'll definitely take a look at it. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, let's see what some of the popular Quora posts end, end up being. You know, this is stuff that, you know, will, will be promoted on Quora's front page. And obviously this is, a, this is a feature that they're rolling out so they want people to use it. But I, I find it very interesting. Amber, I tend to be more of a Quora lurker. I don't ask <laughs> a lot of questions. Um, I have answered a few things, but it's, it's more just kind of a, it's like a knowledge base for me. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how many people decide to put in effort to write something that wasn't prompted by anyone else's question. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it could take a while. Uh, one thing that uh, I saw in the news recently, and I tweeted about this, and I don't know, a lot of people were upset about this. Some people, a few people thought it was good, but I read on Mash Mashable, and I'm sure you saw this, Sarah, you're much more of a foodie than I am. But uh, the idea that potentially uh, there will be restaurants, there are right now in New York City, for example, where restaurants are saying that uh, they don't want you taking any photos of their meals, and uh, they don't want those photos shared online. 
What do you think about this as someone who probably eats out more than I do? Well, okay, I admit I have curbed some of my food and wine pictures lately because I don't feel that anyone really gets much out of it besides me. What, you know, with some exceptions, but I still do take photos of my Mm -hmm. food quite a bit, even if I'm not putting them on Instagram or, or wherever because sometimes it's very memorable or it's like, oh, this dessert is beautiful. I just have to take a picture before I eat it and ruin it. But I don't understand how restaurants would be able to enforce this. It's kind of like saying you can't take a photo in a locker room at a gym. And I totally agree that no one should be doing that, but I could easily do that. No one's paying that much attention. It's not really an enforceable thing, um, especially, you know, you, you can be kind of in stealth mode and you pretend you're looking at something and all of, these, all of a sudden- you Sarah, you're, you're kind of creeping me out right now with the locker room example. <laughs> you know what I mean. Okay, there are places, okay, when you're waiting in line to go through customs, they don't want you to, you know, okay, be taking better. pictures of that either. I'm trying to think of like very obvious. <laughs> okay, I know, that's right. I don't take pictures of people in locker rooms. I, I Note promise. to self, I <laughs> when I go back to San Francisco, we are not going to the gym together. No, that's, you know, it's a good reason to change it home that's all i'm saying but but uh but but i just don't i don't quite get it is it because they think well maybe there's you know uh, romantic mood lighting in our restaurant you know we're, we're a lovely french restaurant but it's going to make the food look drab because it's not going to be bright and it won't capture what it actually feels like to be eating the food so that's just bad publicity do you think that's I, part of it i think it's ridiculous i'm totally with you and in fact i had such uh, strong opinions coming at me on twitter which i totally agreed with you know i had one person writing and saying that if a restaurant said that i would just literally pick up and leave they said that you know that's just part of their experience that's how they love to share places that they they like to go and for most restaurants i think there's definitely more of an advantage than there is a disadvantage in terms of that type of sharing so i'm i you know even if maybe they don't like it because they can't control it. Hey, you got to realize that this is just the world that we live in. And unfortunately, you're going to probably lose a bigger audience than uh, gain people who think that's okay. So I think it's ridiculous. I uh, I don't think that it's it really enforceable. And, and that's probably the biggest issue, like you mentioned. Right. Yeah. It's just, it's, it, it's, it's one of those stories where you go, ah, people in restaurants still don't understand how technology works. Oh, well, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, yeah. guess, I hope you make a good burger. <laughs> Pretty much. I know. It's a little bit silly. Um, okay. So speaking of something that's uh, not so, so silly, we're, t- we're ready to uh, move on now to our social tip. And uh, over the past few weeks, when we talk about, talked about social media marketing campaigns, Sarah and I have mentioned that we both love reading Advertising Age. And I feel like for digital marketing, especially, there are so many great examples of people who are doing it well or poorly. And they really dive into the, this content much more than you would find on Mashable and other sites. So uh, for the social tip this week, thought it would be fun to recommend uh, Advertising Age has just come out with their own iPad app. So uh, you may want to uh, take a peek at that. Uh, It is uh, free, although you do have to pay for additional uh, uh, content if you're not a subscriber. But uh, I think for most people, you'll be able to find uh, quite a bit of useful content in there. Now you have it on the go. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm downloading it right now. Ad Age. If you just type in Ad Age, it comes up as Advertising Age, um, but it's, uh, it's pretty much your well, it's your second result, actually, if you type in Ad Age um, mm-hmm. in, in the App Store. I'm downloading it on my iPad now. But yeah, I, I, uh, this is awesome. I was actually, um, I, was, uh, I, w- I was out of uh, iPad today this week because I had a little accident. But um, this would have been one of my picks had I been on the show. Hopefully, I would have found it. Although, Amber, you and I both um, say that we're teaching each other, you know, apps that, remember last uh, week you taught me, like, what was it? Cyc- oh, Cycloramic. Cycloramic, which I had never heard of, and it was quite a hit on i5 on Monday, let me tell you. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, it was. I gave you credit. I thanked you profusely. Ha, thank yeah. you. But no, this is, a, this is really nice. Ad Age. Let's, uh, let's open it really quick and just take a look at it. Since we mentioned it, get a sense of what it, what it kind of looks like here on the iPad. Would you like to do something? Not right now. Notifications, not really into it. Oh, this might take a while. Yeah, it's sinking a little bit. Sometimes our, our Wi-Fi network can be a little bit weird with iPad apps. Well, we'll come back to it. But um, that is a good tip. You know, speaking of iPad apps, Amber, not that we want to make this too iPad heavy. And I'm actually, this is actually an iPhone app, not an iPad app. But for uh, the purposes of demonstration, the iPad kind of works better over the mm-hmm. shoulder here. But Twitter... Twitter bought a company called Vine not that long ago. And Vine was a, uh, a service that hadn't even launched. And the idea was sort of six second quick videos. Let's go ahead to explore. Uh, quick videos that, um, popular now, uh, that, that, that folks were making. 
Now you say, uh, what does that mean? So it's basically, it, Vine allows you to create these short bursts of video. Now we're looking at sort of a time-lapse thing of a banana. That's quite a few little uh, bursts of video at, at once. Okay, so that's, that's one uh, example. But then there's sort of this, ooh, that's kind of neat. All right, see what I'm getting at here? So this is the sort of thing that it can definitely be artistic uh, or it can just be, um, yeah. well, these are all really good. Let's get, <laughs> this is, you know, this is a little bit more of like a, okay, you know, we're just like making funny faces, uh, you know, with our coworkers type of a thing. So it's a little bit of a, and, and I think Amber, you know, my first reaction, I had heard of Vine before, even when it was, when, when it was an, uh, not yet launched um, app, um, and I thought, well, you know, this is this kind of seems like those animated GIF apps that we've talked about in the past, and and it's you know there's what what's really that different about it? And I think you know number one is this is the, this is a Twitter company, and so they've certainly got you know the Twitter army and you know marketing and and, and PR team behind it. Um, it's very nice. Uh, fa Facebook has already pulled its API access um, from, I know. from Vine, which which means that when you sign up, there's you know not an easy way to say, hey, who of my Facebook friends are using Vine as well, so I can quickly populate my feed. So that's a drag, but otherwise, it's pretty cool. Um, I've got a lot of activity because I guess a lot of people are following me now, probably because they found me on Twitter, uh, and that's great. But Amber, I have to say, and I don't want to be a negative Nancy, because. Uh, because I don't, but I already use Twitter quite a bit. I mean, even if mm. I'm not the most frequent tweeter, I mean, I'm refreshing my feed every five seconds. Twitter is a re really big part of my life. I don't know that I need this Twitter offshoot to be as big a part of my life, you know? Yeah. I, well, maybe I mean, I'm we getting to saturation point with this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the, you know, the, the nature of text content is that it's so much easier to read. You don't have to, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, be in a place where people are sensitive to things like audio and noise. And with something like video, you, you just can't watch it as many places, I think. Um, so I don't know. I just tried Vine for the first time. Right before the show, I sent out a little six second promo. And uh, I thought, you know, one thing that's good about it, though, is how simple it is to use and cut together those really quick six second videos, just holding your finger on it. And then you can record. It's super, super easy. Easy. Uh, the thing I will say, though, and I kind of screwed this up because I'm so used to not shooting uh, vertical videos. I want to shoot everything in landscape mode is that it's portrait mode. So just a warning, my most recent video came out uh, where I'll be talking sideways like this to you. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. So it's super easy to use. If you want to send video out on Twitter, I think it's a really great option. Yeah, I love it. I just uh, I just made a little video while you were talking. And um, this is, uh, all right, let's go, yes, sure, uh-huh. My first post on Vine, share on Vine. Okay, done. All right, here we go. And, well, there, look, ooh, okay, all right. There's Amber and Amber and me <laughs> and there, okay, all right. That's kind of fun, I guess. It's fun, yeah. Yeah, it's easy to, it's easy to do. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a nice service. Uh, it's definitely getting a lot of attention right now. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, it's yet one more way to kind of take that Instagram basis and 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 kick it up a notch. And uh, I mean, it's free. It's certainly something that you know you should try. If anyone has made a great vine that they're really proud of, and they really want us to look at, will you email us at thesocialhouratwit.tv because please do. Yeah, we would, we would like to see something like that. Yeah, I mean, I we'd, yeah. Rather than my silly vine, I'd rather actually show some, you know, stop motion um, creative artwork that you guys have put together. It'd be fun too if you had something like a social tip and you could squeeze it into six seconds. That would be very, very impressive, and uh, it would be fun to play in the show. So uh, that would be cool to get. So let us know. And Sarah, I should say uh, this is the best thing about doing a show like this because we can do it all kind of live and chat. Uh, Steve Garfield did make us a video, and I forgot to send you the link. I just sent it to you uh, in our little chat window. And maybe it's too late to include but it is about uh, Obama's inauguration this past week and social media. Uh, if we can't include it, fine, but thanks hey, to Sarah, Steve for hey sending Amber, it. Amber, this is Chris Matthew. I'm oh, no, that's a different video. Oh, uh, yeah, let's roll it in. Why not? This is the beauty awesome. of live. Oh, hey, guys, this is Steve Garfield, and the biggest social event of the week was the presidential inauguration. I don't know, like you guys, I got a ton of emails asking me to watch online, download the app, 
do two things at once and get all the trivia. Well, I didn't do any of that. I don't think social TV is not watching the TV and looking down at a device. I want to watch the inauguration and see what's happening. So that's what I did. But I think the social part of the presidential inauguration was people and all the connections I have via social media. And one of the best is Jim Long, who on Twitter is New Media Jim. And if you follow him, you'll get a lot of behind the scenes because he's a cameraman for NBC. And the night before, you got a glimpse of what was happening because he went to bed early and he had a wake up call at 3 a.m. to go to the Capitol and get ready. And then when he got there and he set up his camera, he was right at the camera at the podium looking down at where Obama was going to be inaugurated and he put that up on Instagram and then NBC re-Instagrammed his Instagram. So I felt <laughs> that I had someone right there. Social media is people telling me the story and being um, my attendee to, to give us a glimpse of what was going on there. That's awesome. That is really, you know, I, I, I'm a little embarrassed, Amber, that, you know, the inauguration was not part of our lineup, um, it, not that I wasn't interested in it, but it sort of came and went. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's and of course, this is US-based, so not everybody is as interested about the inauguration, and probably a lot of Republicans aren't either. But, uh, but, but, but yeah, that's, um, that's a good tip for uh, New Media Jim. Um, I'm not following him. I certainly will be now after this show. And yeah. thanks, thanks, Steve. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm glad we fit it in. I was thinking, you know, normally we can save stuff till the next week, but this was so timely that yeah. I wanted to make sure that we can include it. So it's really fun, I mean, to get all these uh, viewer and listeners uh, videos, especially with perspective like that, because I definitely will follow New Media Jim, although I feel like I've seen him post stuff already. And I totally agree. Sometimes, you know, it's great to get that behind the scenes look and feedback. And uh, thanks, Steve, for doing that video. Absolutely. You know, we got two videos this week. Um, this is uh, Chris Matthew. He's uh, Chris Matthew on Twitter. Um, he's made a Twitter call-in service, and he would like us to talk about it, and he was so nice to make a video that I thought um, we'd, we'd give him a little plug. Take it away, Chris. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Amber. This is Chris Matthew. I'm a longtime listener, uh, going way back to the Net at Night days. Um, I launched a new uh, social telephone platform called Twelephone. Uh, several months ago, and it recently got uh, TechCrunch coverage last week and Gizmodo coverage, and I wanted to show you guys and, and uh, see what you think. Um, basically, everyone has a telephone number already, so if you go to telephone.com slash Amber Mac, uh, that's your telephone number. So people, you can put that link in your tweets or in your emails, and uh, people could call you on it just like a real uh, uh, telephone, except you get some cool things. You get video, HD video, HD voice, and it's peer-to-peer -peer and encrypted. So, you know, this stuff is better than Skype. And the best news is that it's 100% HTML5. It uses a technology called WebRTC. That stands for Real-Time Communications. And uh, no Flash, no Java, just pure browser-based uh, uh, telephone calls. And... Um, it's, uh, it only works in Chrome so far. That's the only browser that's implemented um, WebRTC, but more browsers coming soon. Hey, well, Sarah, let me show you yours. Oh. Yours, yours <laughs> as well, Sarah Lane. Okay. Telephone.com slash Sarah Lane. There you go. Yeah. Boy, I could I add got... you to my contacts. I, change I could background. invite you to join. Um, or I could call you. No. Let me, let me know what you think, please. Telephone.com. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Chris, not only for uh, making the video and, you know, putting some production effort into it, um, but also making such a cool service. I, I, yeah. I wasn't familiar with it, Telephone, so it's like telephone with a W after the T. But uh, what do you think, Amber? You and I, ha we're always sort of lamenting the, you know, the, the, the phone call, uh, but uh, I love uh, telephone alternatives. I mean, if I can, if I'm already on my computer, and I've got Chrome open. Chrome is the browser that I use. Uh, I, I like having options. Yeah, no, I think it's cool to have options. And uh, uh, I think it's fun. You know, so many of these little services like this, they may not appeal to everybody, but they always can find that community. So it seems like this is one that potentially will be able to find a group of people that uh, like it already if he hasn't already found that. So thank you for the video. It's uh, fun to watch and, uh, and get some, uh, a suggestion like that. All right, so we've got a, this is actually something, Amber, usually you come up with um, where we sort of have our weekly, is it tweet of the week or meme of the week or, or whatever. And I, I thought this week, 
Tumblr of the week. Uh, it's got to be Tumblr of the week because this was actual Facebook graph searches.tumblr.com. This, of course, is in response to Facebook's new uh, graph search where you search for, and we talked about this last Friday, um, and it wasn't actually live at that point, but I now have it. Uh, Amber, I don't know if uh, it's been rolled out um, to you on Facebook yet. Yeah, you know what? I haven't even checked. That shows you how out of touch I am with it. <laughs> well, I will, um, John, I, I, I plugged in my, um, my screen. Uh, so if you want to, aha, here we go. So this is my new little Facebook thing. So I've, you, you've got sort of my messages and other people and notifications all sort of moved over to the right side. And now front and center, big, big is, you know, my friends who like ice cream and live in San Francisco. I hope somebody does. Ice cream parlors, oh well. Okay, well Dave Morton, <laughs> Matt Galligan, Josh Craig. <laughs> okay, a lot of people uh, who, who like ice cream and, uh, and are my friends and live in San Francisco. So that's the whole idea. It's like you're searching your social graph for particular things based on location, likes, uh, and information about your friends. However, getting back to the Tumblr of the week, and this is hysterical, is actual Facebook graph searches that was performed by a certain guy, uh, his name is Tom uh, Scott. And for example, you know, these are just sort of like silly searches. Mothers of Jewish people who like bacon, for example. Now the reason <laughs> that this works is this is, you know, someone who uh, says that, you know, they are of the Jewish faith they, they, in their biography, there is, you know, they are someone's mom and they like bacon. Now, they added all of that information. It's not as if this is a secret, but when you put it in this context of, 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 the, of the graph search, it's pretty funny. Married people who like prostitutes. Well, there are a few people who show up there too. Uh, why? I don't know. I don't know what, what, if that was a joke. I mean, a lot of a lot of this stuff, you know, is maybe something that was added and the context is completely gone a really long time ago. So it's a very good look into, not only is it just hysterical, but um, why you really want to make sure you're, you're sharing what you think you're sharing online. And if you are sharing something that is extremely sensitive that you either don't want anyone to see or only want some people to see, it's a good time to go through your settings with an extremely finely tooth comb. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, very cool. So, uh, um, so Sarah, we should, uh, I guess right now we're going to get into our rad or fad. Is that, uh, we're almost there now? Yeah, we are. Um, we certainly are, Amber. How did that happen? Gosh, it's almost the end of the hour. I, I know. know. I can't believe it. Where it's unbelievable. I think it was Seth. Seth threw us off. He did. He was great. It was uh, a ton of fun. Okay, so uh, I've been kind of waiting to share this router fad because I know, Sarah, that you have the Fuel Band. I also have the Fuel Band from Nike. Uh, I'm not sure if you have uh, the Fitbit. I do. I um, I actually received one when I was at LeWeb uh, back in December. Okay. And, and I haven't even taken it out of the baggage. Uh, oh. I don't know why, what my problem is. I'm almost like, oh, it's going to become this really essential part of my life and then I'm going to have to go to the gym more and I don't know. So yes, I have one and no, I don't have much experience with it. Okay, okay. So uh, I don't have much experience with the Fitbit, but definitely with the Fuel Band. And so I was really interested to stumble across this uh, new app and it's called the Moves app. And basically Moves is an iOS download that allows you to do similar things that you could do with the Fuel Band in the sense that it will record things like your daily walking, if you're cycling or running, uh, it kind of tells where you are, how many cal calories you've burned, uh, how many steps you've taken, but it does all of this on the phone and the app is completely free. So it's almost like a a daily journal of your physical activity, except you don't have to cough up, you know, $150 for it. I love it. I think this mm -hmm. is great. I, I, this is, this is such a big space right now. In, it is, that, yeah. in a way, I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, it's, it's like everybody, well, not everybody, but um, I, there's a, there's a, a, a fellow I know who's putting together a fitness app that hasn't even launched yet. And he's got a lot of press. It's, it's, this kind of stuff is, I love where it's all going. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we need as many gadgets and as many apps to track fitness or motivate or be able to, you know, share with others as 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 we have. Um, it kind of dilutes the whole space, but it's also nice to have uh, different options. I mean, some of, some of these apps I've tried out, and I think it's great for me. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know if it's great. It's going to like be like a huge scaling type of an app. But do you? I mean, does this seem like something that you would you would use on a daily basis? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty rad. And, and I do love the fuel band. The only issue I have is that, uh, you know, I have to kind of charge it, take it off. Uh, I forget to put it on some days. So it's harder to kind of fit into my daily routine, whereas I always have my phone on me. So this becomes very interesting, the idea that this just becomes part of another app that I have on my phone where I can track all of my activities. So I kind of, I like that concept. Uh, and I think the way that they map it out, if you look at some of the screenshots uh, within the iTunes store, that it really does look like a daily journal of, of all the activity you've done and it kind of puts things a little bit more in perspective. So agree, this is a big category as far as people getting data about their own activity, about themselves, about what type of food they're eating, all that information. But I do think uh, they've done a pretty slick job of displaying some of this and uh, I, I'm definitely going to try it out. So I think, I think it's kind of rad. I think it's rad too. I really do. Especially, hey, we're in the first few weeks of January. A lot of people have resolutions yeah. to be more fit. Uh, I am one of those people. Uh, I, I really sort of fell off the wagon uh, towards the end of last year. Year. And this, it really does help to, to, to be active in tracking what you did, you know, rather than mm -hmm. saying, well, I don't know when I exercised last. It's like you have a very clear indicator of what you've been doing and what you haven't been doing. Um, you know, like a food journal. It's, it's the, those sorts of things are always helpful. Always helpful. And the th best thing about it with this particular app is that it's completely free. So you haven't wasted any money by uh, giving it a whirl. It's free and uh, maybe it could even help you. Yeah, that's great. So it is, if you're looking for it in the App Store, it is Moves. So M-O-V-E-S. Um, there you go. And it's, it's cute. It's got a little, little phone and a jean pocket. All right. So that <laughs> is pretty much it for this episode of The Social Hour. want to remind you that we love hearing from you. Um, it's so fun to get your videos. By the way, if you have a video that you want to share with us, please upload it somewhere and send us the link. Sometimes you send us actual attachments and we can't open those. So um, videos are always appreciated, but we also love your emails. The social hour at twit.tv is how you get a hold of us with questions and comments or ideas. You can also leave us a voicemail. That number is 2626-SOCIAL. So 2626-S-O-C-I-A-L. And we're live on Fridays, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. It's a lot of fun to be here live with us. But don't worry, if you can't catch us live or you just like subscribing and watching on demand, all free, of course, twit.tv slash TSH is where you can catch up on episodes or subscribe to the show as well. You can find us on iTunes. You can write us a nice little review if you really like the show. We, we wouldn't say no to that. Um, mm -hmm. Until next week, I'm Sarah Lane. <laughs> and I'm Amber MacArthur, and we'll see you soon. I'll be Sarah Lane next week, too. Ha, ha, ha.